shout for joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sing praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds toward the children of man. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the river on foot. There did we rejoice in him who rules by his might forever, whose eyes keep watch on the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard, who has kept our soul among the living and has not let our feet slip. For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver has, is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid a crushing burden on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, yet you have brought us out to a place of abundance. I will come into your house with burnt offerings. I will perform my vows to you, that which my lips uttered, and my mouth promised when I was in trouble. I will offer you burnt offerings of fattened animals. With the smoke of the sacrifice of rams, I will make an offering of bulls and goats. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell what he has done for my soul. This morning, as we get to know one another, I have to apologize. I do run around the stage a little bit, just so you know. Um, I want to share with you my story. I want to tell you a little, about, a little bit about who I am and also where my personal belief in theology lies. Perhaps at the end of it, the direction as to the way I see fit that God is calling me to lead the youth ministry. But my story, as you've heard, begins in Enterprise, Alabama. Now, my father was a military man. He was a medevac pilot for the Army. And uh, when I was, I believe, two years old, um, he retired at Fort Rucker, became part of the DOD and civil service. He is now ultimately responsible for the defense of Eglin Air Force Base and of Fort Rucker. Um, my sister, uh, four years older than me, I think. I'm not sure. She's old. Um, uh, she... Um, we grew up going to church. Anytime the doors were open, my parents had me in church. My parents were very strong believers. They would have us in church and children's ministry and Awanas and anything and everything that the church had to offer. However, there was a problem. You see, as a child, I asked a lot of questions. A lot of not normal questions that a eight-year-old would ask when it came to questions about God and theology. You see, at the time, there was a, a preacher man whose name I do not recall, basically said to me, or said to the congregation, as long as you're a Christian, as long as you believe hard enough, and everything in life will be perfect, you'll never be sick, nothing ever bad will happen to you. That was hard for me considering my mother had cancer. Just tell you right now, no one talks about mama. I'm just, I'm a very big mama's boy and I protect mama. Got me into a little bit of trouble at school when people talk about, you know, your mama jokes. I didn't take that too kindly. So as a child, at eight years old, mom was diagnosed with cancer. Dad had encouraged me to go to the front. I didn't know why. I just, I wanted to please my dad, as any son would want to. He said, why don't you go to the front and talk to the preacher about being baptized and being saved and all this, that, and the other. I didn't understand it. I didn't know why. I just wanted to please my dad. So that's what I did. Didn't understand it, didn't, have, didn't know why, but I began to have these questions. And what I was told, you don't need to ask those questions, you just need to have faith. Let's be honest, there is a little bit of truth to that, but as far as the questions concerned, I think that questions are important. Helps you understand your faith, which is why I study apologetics. I'll get to that in a little bit. Around age 10, mother came out of, uh, she, she went into remission. Uh, she has been cancer-free for 20 years, some however old I am, not sure, um, and uh, still had questions though. But around that time for me, my, my, my athletic abilities and my, my love of soccer began to 
capture my identity. I began to focus on that. Church began to become more of a burden to me than a joy. I didn't really want to go to church, but it's what my parents made me do. Fortunately, or unfortunately, soccer began to take its, uh, take its place and tournaments began to happen on Saturdays and Sundays, and so we would miss a, lot, a good bit of church because I was on a pretty good team, and normally we would win. Um, so that encompassed my identity. Soccer completely took over my life. In fact, it's what I wanted to do. It, I had ambitions to play one day for the U.S. international men's team, and Lord knows I need all the help they can get right now. Um, but I had ambitions to do that, to go to college, play soccer, go to the professional level and play soccer. That's what I wanted to do. Unfortunately for me, because of, of my aggressiveness and how, how tough I was, one of my coaches said, I know what position I want to put you in. And for those of you that do have a proper knowledge of soccer, maybe you don't, that position was a sweeper. The sweeper's job is to protect the goalie. So you're, my job was to tackle players, to take them down no matter the cost. I was to protect the goalie. You also have a target painted on your back because other players will come at you and elbow you in the ribs and cheap shot you. So about 10, 10 years of, of that, injuries began to add up. Around 16 years old, I had no ambition to go to church, and all of a sudden, hey, I can drive. As long as mom sees the car there at the church when she walks in, and as long as the car is back there before church lets out, she'll think I'm at church. And so that's what I did. I waited to see mother and father. They'd walk into church. Me and my friends, we'd go jump in the car, go hang out at the Walmart, because that's what you did in Enterprise. <laughs> I began to realize how serious colleges were looking at me for soccer, but I had an attitude problem. In fact, in one season, I got ejected out of eight games, because not because of my aggressive nature, because I couldn't keep my mouth shut. Because I had to mouth off to the ref, because, oh, trust me, I knew better than that referee did. Um, so some colleges were interested, but they said I had an attitude problem. You're going to have to go. It would be best if you go to a community college or play with a NCAA sanctioned club, something of that nature. So that's what I did. I went to, a, a, to Troy University to play with their club team at the time, and then I was going to transfer to a, a bigger school. I always didn't like practice, and for this particular time, I really didn't like practice. Because injuries, like I said, began to take their toll. And unfortunately, during a practice, I took a bad fall. Pretty much blew out my knee. And doctor said, you're done. There's no more for this. What they told me was, your identity has just been removed. See, for 10 or so years, that's what I identified as, as a soccer player. I went to church, but I, I didn't really, I didn't care. I didn't care about God. I didn't care. I had these questions, but I was told, don't ask those questions. They're not important. Just keep them to yourself. And based on what the preacher said, if, if everything was perfect, why did my mother have cancer? Why do bad things happen? All these questions began to rampage my mind. And, and, and when, I, when, I, when my identity was stripped away, because I went to church, I thought I was saved, I said, God, where are you in this moment? God, don't, I go to church, right? I, I sometimes tithe. I at least pray when it's convenient. I mean, don't you care about me, God? Why are you allowing this to happen? I began to not believe in God. Became agnostic, as some of you may have heard that term. And though I had been working in a Christian camp for several years and as a sports counselor and even taught Bible study, I still had questions. And I was in one of the darkest places I've ever been. My identity had been stripped away from me. I was not sure if there was a God because of what I was told. I was not disciplined enough to study the Bible for myself begin to have a lot of doubt and a lot of depression. When someone's identity is ripped away from them like that, and that's all you've known for years, you turn to anything and everything. For me, for me it was alcohol and sleeping around. That's what I did for the next two years at Troy. 
struggled with alcohol, trying to fill this emptiness that I felt in my life. People told me, you need, you, no, you need Jesus. Oh, I got Jesus. I go to church. I mean, even the demons believe in shudder. Come on. So I began to have even more questions and more doubts. And in fact, I began this journey of saying, I am not sure that this God that I've been told is real. So I began to try to disprove it. Became very agnostic, using science, using things as what I believed in. It was only through that research that God revealed himself to me. It's, it's funny, a lot of people say that, that science and, and sometimes history are the enemies of Christianity. In fact, science complements Christianity because it confirms the validity of a God. I mean, if, on all, in all honesty, I don't see one around here, but if we were to have a painting, if I were to have a painting, it would be foolish for us to say that this painting just simply came to being, that it would have to have a painter. If this building that we're in, it would be silly for us to say that this building, it just, it just happened. No, this building has to have a builder. Well, is it so audacious then to say that creation simply doesn't have a creator? No, creation has to have a creator. It has to. It only makes sense. So at age 19, the Holy Spirit begins moving in me and working truly for the first time, working in me and moving in me. I believe I begin to see who God truly is. And at the time, one of the, one of the, the uh, college pastors named Thomas Winborn came, came to me and would begin to answer these questions of why do bad things happen? Why, why isn't life perfect? And he basically pointed me to James and 1 John. In James, I discovered where we as Christians should embrace suffering, that it will happen, but that God also gives us a promise that in him you find peace. In him you find comfort. We live in a broken world that is impacted with sin, and this is the result of that sin, this brokenness, this emptiness, disease, cancer, Natural disasters are a result of living in a broken world impacted by sin. And that's why Jesus says, come to me all ye who are heavy laden and in me you find rest. Because Jesus knew what we would face. At 21 is when I truly, truly got saved. When I was 21 years old and surrendered my life. It was April, it was Easter morning when I, when I was baptized and began this journey as to following God truly for the first time. And in the back of my mind, I knew, because of the work I had previously done at the Christian sports camp, I knew what he was leading me to. Oh, trust me, I did not want to do it. Oh, no, God, you've got the wrong guy. That is not going to happen. I said, God I, God, I don't even like people. Why do you want me to be a minister? I... I've been working with kids all this time, and I, really? Kid? No. So I tried to run from God. It didn't work too well. Um, I, be I believe around um, a couple of years had gone past, and I had uh, eventually, I, I had actually failed out of Troy University because uh, I didn't go to class in that, in that uh, time, and um, apparently you have to. Um, no one told me. Um, but because I have loving parents, Dad said, why don't you just move back in, try to go to the, to the Wallace Community College in Dothan, um, work, just try to, try to figure this whole Christian thing out. So very gracious of my father. He's a military man, and I was thinking he's going to kick me outside and make me sleep under the stars. I don't want to do that. Um, but very gracious man, very loving man. And so I moved back. I was able to get my uh, associate's degree in drafting and design architecture, and um, all the time thinking, man, you know, God's got a great plan for me. I'm going to build these great houses, design these awesome houses. I'm going to be awesome. That's who I'm going to be. And God's like, you're going to be a minister. I'm like, no, I'm not. So um, so some time had passed. I had been saved, and some time had passed, and uh, was studying, trying to figure out, you know, how am I going to get a job in drafting and design? Nothing was coming available, and, and I knew all the time God was calling me, leading me to to be a minister, and I kept trying to say, no, I, I don't want to be a minister. I said, I just, that's not who I am. Around uh, 20, 2010, I think it was, um, I got accepted into the South Alabama Engineering School for mechanical engineering. 
And I thought, okay, all right, told you, not going to be a minister. Um, little did I know that God moving me to Mobile would be the best decision I've ever made in my life. Because not only did I begin my ministry, but I met my wife um, at church. Uh, let's just be honest, I was the drummer at the church, and, you know, she thought I was cute. So um, that's really not the story. Uh, she actually couldn't stand me when we first met, but I just had this, you know, this charm about me, you know. And, you know, I was able to... Uh, um, text her to go out with me. Ask her, <laughs> ask her that later. Um, but I realized when I was in, we were in New York on mission work. We had uh, just started dating, I think, or we were talking. Uh, we were in that awkward stage, you know how it is. Um, and, uh, and I had some alone time. I knew God was calling me to ministry, and I kept trying to fight it, kept trying to fight it. Um, we were in New York, and I was on a uh, construction team, which was hysterical because I know nothing about destruction. I know how to design stuff on a computer, but I can't build stuff. So, um, so I don't know why they put me on the construction team for that particular trip. But there was one day that we got back early. So I was back in our dorm, and, and I was the only one there. My roommates, were they were off, lost in New York somewhere, texting me. We don't know where we're at. And I was like, why are you texting me? I don't know anything about New York. So... Um, and I just got a little alone time with God in my Bible, and I just so distinctively heard God in that moment saying, stop running. Stop this foolishness. I've called you for something greater. And I knew in that moment, I knew what God was talking about. I knew that he wanted me to, to follow him and, and to, to teach students. It's what I'd been doing. And I knew that was the call, and I finally said, I'm tired of running. I was exhausted from running from God, just exhausted, and said, okay, enough. I'm, I'm just going to surrender to your will, and I'm going to trust you, God. I'm going to trust you with this. Immediately, we got back from New York, and there, were, uh, there was a great trip. Um, immediately transferred to Baptist College of Florida, began to pursue my degree in uh, biblical studies with a, with a primary focus in youth ministry and North American missions. And uh, graduated, began to pursue a degree in apologetics. And this is where the fun part comes. Why apologetics? Now, the apologetics, as you said, is not um, making an apology for the gospel. It's defending the gospel. In fact, the word apologetic comes from the Greek word apologia, which is actually a legal term. It is, it is when you make a defense. And so Christian apologetics is to make a defense for the gospel. And in fact, my primary focus with this is to defend the gospel without using the gospel. I use things like science and history, actually mathematics, to show who Jesus, that Jesus truly is, was a real man, that God truly is the creator of the universe. That's what they teach us in apologetics, is to be able to defend the gospel. And that's, that's essentially what I bring to the table. I teach students how to defend their faith. I think in this time, in this nature that we're in, this culture that we're in, which is extremely becoming more post-Christian than ever, not only students, but people, Christians, believers, need to know how to defend their faith. Amen. Need to stand on the ground of the gospel and say, I believe in God and here's why. You need to understand what you believe and why you believe it. And that's what I tell students all the time. You've got to read your Bible. You've got to understand what you believe. You've got to be ready in all seasons to make a defense. People are attacking the Bible more and more daily. And if we, the church, cannot defend ourselves, then we will fall into the trap, the trap of the world that says you don't need God, make your own path have to understand what you believe. You have to know why you believe it. You have to be able to defend it. In all honesty, the gospel doesn't need to be defended. That's like defending a lion. You don't need to defend the lion. But if we are to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to carry this gospel out into the nations, which we are commanded to do, then we had better know what we're talking about. Amen. So for youth, and for students, and what you'll, what you'll get with me, is a, is a come and see spirituality with a go and tell mentality. The come and see spirituality is come, be a part 
of what God is doing at the, in, in a local church. Come see that God is good. Come see what's going on. Study the Word. Pray to God. Worship Him. Everything you do should be about God. In fact, the very definition of worship, I think Louis Giglio gives this, is that worship is giving God His breath back. Which means to me that every breath we breathe, because it's borrowed, should be a direct praise back to God. In any given moment, in any given situation, we should be giving God His breath back. Every single time. Am I perfect at it? No. Because let me just be honest, when my football team starts to lose, I definitely am not worshiping God in that moment. Let's just be honest, all right? But I mean, I'm an Alabama fan, so we don't lose. So, um, <laughs> um, yeah, that, that national championship was just a fluke. Um, but come and see that the Lord is good. And that's, how, that's, that's why I encourage students. I see a couple over here. That's why I encourage students to get involved. Take advantage of church. Engage the gospel. I could, I've only, statistically, statistically, the average Christian comes to church 52 hours a year. A year. Now, me and some friends have been able to break that down a little bit. What about biblical study, especially from a student perspective? Proper biblical study. Well, what I define proper biblical, proper biblical study is you spending time in God's Word. So if all you're doing is basing your Christianity on 52 hours per year, that's pretty bad. But if, you're, if you are not reading God's Word, if you're just basing that on 52 hours, the number actually shrinks. If you are simply engaging the gospel in that time frame, chances of you actually reading the gospel for yourself get narrowed down to two hours a year of proper biblical study. That means personal biblical study for yourself. Students, church, you have to engage the gospel. Ministers like Dr. George and myself, we're here to help you. But this can't be it for you. This, you can't walk out the door and say, okay, I got my Jesus for the week, I'm good. The church is where Christians come together to heal wounds, to love each other, to fellowship. This is not, the church is not a social country club for the social elite. It's more like a hospital unit or a mass unit on the battlefield where Christians and believers can come together to worship with one another, to praise God together, and to heal wounds. That is what the church is. When you engage out there, you also need to be engaging the gospel. You need to be ready for anything that may come your way. You need to be ready. So come and see. Come and see what God is doing. And then the last bit, go and tell mentality. Now, yes, we have the, the titles of ministers. But every single person in this room is a minister in their own right. You have a place that God has put you for a reason, and that reason is so you can share the gospel wherever you are. Amen. You have access to places we don't necessarily. You have, you have employers or you have or people you work with that you can engage with, that you see daily, that you can use with the gospel. This is the go and tell mentality. Now our ultimate goal, in my opinion, my, the ultimate goal of being a Christian is to worship God. But he also gives us a command to go and tell, to make disciples of all nations. This is not a suggestion. This is a command. And he says, ultimately, I will also give you a promise. I'll be with you wherever you go. So in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, starting in verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You see, we have a command and a promise here in this scripture, in this go and tell mentality. The, the command is, you don't have an option. You are to go and tell. You are to speak the gospel to any and all people that you come across. Any moment is an opportunity for you to share the gospel. It's for me to share the gospel. But don't do this with a spirit of fear. Do this 
with the, with the mindset that God is with you, that he is guiding you, he is giving you wisdom, he is discerning for you, helping you to discern his will. And in all honesty, at the end of the day, it is not our job to save people. That is the Holy Spirit's job. Our job is to simply share the gospel. If they accept it, great. If they don't, that's between them and the Lord. All right? All we can do, all we can do is share the gospel and pray for those people. Be a friend. Be family. That's, that's what we are commanded to do. And with our students, that is what I will bring to the table, is an apologetic style defense where they come and see spirituality with a go and tell mentality. That will be our focus. That will be the primary goal to what I believe God is leading me towards. And I, I hope and pray, hope and pray, that we will come together, united as a family, to impact the community of Panama City Beach, Panama City, and wherever else God may lead us or direct us to go. That we will come together to love people, to show people what true, genuine Christian love means. And that is my hope and prayer for you. So I don't know if we're going to do a, a, an invitation or not, but perhaps this morning there's someone on your mind that you know you need to share the gospel with. And you just need some strength. Well, grab a buddy, grab a friend, a family member, assuming the altar's open, but come, pray for that person that you know needs Christ. And pray, and, and it's not selfish, but pray for yourself for strength to be able to share the gospel. This is that time for us to do. This is where we, we pray with one another. We talk with one another. We lift each other up in the spirit. So you're going to have that opportunity, as I assume Barry's going to come with a song, and be able to, to just reach out to God and cry out to him. God, give me strength. God, help me. This is that moment. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the love and the mercy that you've shown us. God, we just, there is nothing hidden from you. We cannot hide anything from you. So, Father, I pray that we will ask for forgiveness of our sins, that we will, we will seek you out, we will beg for strength, we will beg for grace, God, but you give it to us anyway, even though we don't deserve it. God, as we prepare for the upcoming week, may you guide us, give us the courage to spread your word. Father, as we have a moment of, of invitation and reflection. Will you be all around us in this place? Father God, we love you. We praise you. In Christ's name, amen.